Welcome to the Pharmasource podcast. Today's episode is a live recording from the Women in Pharma Procurement Meetup, a panel discussion we had on International Women's Day, all about how to elevate and support women in an industry that's been traditionally male-dominated. And from some of the examples shared, it shows just how far there is to go. In the poll we ran before the session began, 70% of the audience told us they'd personally experienced obstacles or challenges in their career due to gender. 60% said that women are not adequately represented in leadership positions in their organisation, while only 21% feel their workplace is achieving equal pay for equal work, despite all the efforts to correct that. The panel discussion you're about to hear includes L.K. Gayson, Senior Vice President of Procurement and External Supply at Grunenthal, Dr. Roxana Timmermans, Supply Chain and Procurement Leader, and was chaired by Alicia Ryan, Principal Consultant at Proxima Bain, And there's some great contributions from the audience you'll hear as well. To kick things off, we played this amazing quote from Reshma Sajani when she was interviewed recently on the Diary of a CEO podcast. Reshma founded Girls Who Code and Mums First. And just listen what she has to say. A few years ago, I got asked to give a speech at Bill Gates' summit. The slot that they had given me was between Bill Gates and Warren Buffett. And it was the only speech that anyone was giving. It was a summit of Fortune 100 CEOs. So you can imagine who was in the room. And I remember them saying, you know, this is a really hard speaking slot, Rashma, because most people are really intimidated because Bill and Warren are sitting in the front row and it can be a little scary. And I remember as I was sitting there in the backstage, they had given me 10 minutes to speak. And I remember thinking, man, I wish they gave me 12 because I really had some more stuff to say. And then I remember thinking, how did I become this woman when I used to be that girl? And I remember thinking, yeah, it's because I've been in every single powerful room. I've met every single CEO, every president, every prime minister. And when I meet them, I'm like, you? You're running what? (laughs) Me and my girls, we can run circles around you. And I realized that it's never been about whether we're qualified, whether we're prepared, whether we're ready, that we've really never really dissected all of the undeserved unearned privilege that so many people have and that we have literally bought and been fed basically this propaganda that we're not good enough that we're not smart enough that we don't belong and the real resistance in this moment is saying no more i'm not reading those books i'm not taking those courses i'm not taking that class i'm not buying into that bullshit. i'm here and i can lead too Hi, everyone. I'm Elke Gesse. I'm currently heading the procurement and external supply organization at Brunenthal. I'm uh, six months in that role, so it was quite a step up from my previous role. Um, before, I worked nine years at Zoetis in, as well procurement director. Um, um, and Zoetis is the number one in animal health care. And before that, I've worked about 10 years in the fast-moving consumer goods industry. So uh, thank you for the opportunity. First of all, before I introduce myself, I want to wish everyone that have been, has been joining this fantastic meeting um, a happy International Women's Day, because to my knowledge, I don't know if, do we have a happy International Men's Day? Okay, if this is not the case, you know, happy birthday, whatever it is to all of you. Um, I wish you to be successful, but first of all, I wish to be healthy every single day. Now, about me. Introduction. I'm Roxana Timmermans. I'm an ex Bristol Myers Squibb and Biogen um, Procurement Executive. I've been leading contract manufacturing organizations, sourcing and procurement. And, um, you know, very much in the biologics world, uh, making sure that the medicine it is provided to the patients. And um, also it's increasing the revenues of the companies, which were in about 10 billion. Um, my background is really a chemical engineer. I'm a PhD in nanotechnology, very passionate about technology, but much more passionate about business and um, unstoppable when it is coming to uh, empowering, elevating women, not only in pharma, but everywhere. Thank you for the opportunity. Perfect. Thank you so much. So linking into the um, the poll that Luke just ran, you know, really looking at the obstacles that we've faced, if we have faced obstacles from a from a gender perspective, do either of you have have experiences or stories to be able to share of where this has has happened within your career, how you've overcome it, how you've been supported by by women around you? I think I've uh, been quite lucky that I have not. So- 
come across too much bias apart from the occasional like oh it, hey, it happened once to be in a meeting that I was there the head of procurement and uh, I was mistaken to be the trainee for example or um, I got some comments when I went to CPHI oh you look quite young for this position or oh it's refreshing to see a, a female woman so more yeah, a, f- a female a director. So more comments on 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 the on the looks. But apart from that, I cannot complain too much. I've been always been presented with opportunities. Um, I think the biggest roadblock for myself, and that's why I really like the video that Luke uh, displayed, was um, that I suffer from the imposter syndrome. So when I'm in my job, I'm very confident, and I thought it was very interesting because when I sometimes in the past compared my work as the only female and, and I had male colleagues, I was confident that I was doing a good job. But from the moment that that next step comes, I have self-doubt. Can I do it? Will I be able to manage men which are older than me? There was, I, it happened a lot that I had this, this, this doubt. And I think as well, in order to support women more to go to the next step, I think we need to approach women in a different way. So it's not only about, okay, we want to have equal pay for sure, but it's not only about salary. For me, it was more as well, okay, if I get promoted, will I have to travel around the world? Do I still, can I still keep my balance and be there, whether it's for my family, my dog, my parents? Um, as well, um, it, it's, I think I would have been attracted more to the next step as well if they would say, look, we're here to support you. We believe in you. We will, give, we will pro- provide you with the coach. So I think in order to elevate women, we might need to approach them sometimes in a different way than just with titles and salaries. Thank you. That That's really insightful. And Roxana? I was, I remember, pretty young. The only woman in 28 um, men's team. I was the only, I was, yeah, a woman, but, you know, they were calling me a girl. Um, anyhow, so from a challenges perspective, <laughs> At least, you know, an older generation, what I call myself, personally has always been this, um, how do you, I call it uh, work-life romance. It's not even a balance anymore. It's a work-life romance, right? Because they have to love each other so that you make it happen. And um, it has been very difficult to build a family and to raise the children because I was always, you know, the mom, which was not baking enough cookies and was not attending all the ballet trainings. And I mean, I even had, you know, ladies telling me that, I I don't know if you are familiar with the cuckoo uh, mother. So it is practically the bird which puts the eggs in in somebody else's uh, nest and then flies away. I never understood why this comparison, but this from a personal perspective, from a professional perspective, I do have a story and um, I would love to have you guessing in which country this was happening. It has been happening, I would say, 12, 13, 13 years ago. Um, so rapidly, um, the story short, we were going into a negotiation. I was a technical expert. We were designing reactors. We wanted to uh, sell the plant. The plant was 20, 23 millions. Uh, it was a um, delegation of my company of six male and a woman, myself. So we enter in the customer's, uh, you know, meetings, building, we walk in the meeting room and then somebody blocks, physically blocks me to enter the room. Mm. I did not want to, you know, bother anyone. I did not understand very much what is happening on that moment, but he's coming and whispering to me that this is a closed door negotiation and assistants are not allowed. So I was mistaking as the assistant of that group just because you know in that culture folks were not used to have women in negotiation of course my boss is pretty open the door coming back and you know clarifying the situation but now i would love to hear where do you think this was happening no bias towards the countries but it's very special so we have japan as a guest (laughs) in in that oh how did you know yeah exactly (laughs) that's really insightful taking it a step forward how did those around you support you in your moves or or in your challenges and and what do you do now that you're in um you know levels of seniority levels of authority 
to ensure that those women around you are are elevated and um you know kind of progressed and heard I think is important yeah so um as I said before I'm six months now in my new role which was in the beginning quite uh, challenging it was a challenge for me I must say I think sometimes as well I was I had the feeling that I was questioned that I got the position uh, because I'm a woman and you know because now there's a lot of um, they want to elevate women and it's I find it that's great but then here and there you get a question from a male colleague yeah did you got a role hey you got a role but you know they wanted a woman so there was a there was a, one of the first time that I was a little bit confronted more with bias let's say but I want to thank all the women of Brunenthal who are on the call they have been nothing but supportive I've never seen it they were so happy that uh, the company set an example of high, hiring a female leader in a position. And it's them um, who pulled me a bit through in the first months as well. When I was um, I upset or I felt, mm, did I make the right decision? And it were my female peers or my female reports who were extremely um, nice to me and said, no, you need to stick through. You're here for us as well. And uh, yeah. That was that was nice to see. I do have a fantastic experience on super supportive, and this is coming from um, Bristol. My time at Bristol Myers Square. Um, it's it's something really fantastic. I want to share with this audience. Maybe it's inspiring other people, right? Um, I had an absolutely amazing uh, chief procurement officer, and then uh, senior vice president. The vice president was also a woman, and it made a ton of difference. So. You know, within eight months since she arrived, the budgeting process in procurement, LK, you may know it, you know, it's always uh, up and down and very scary, right? Um, it's not a straight line. And I think we were in such a, a fog on the moment when she came. Well, everyone was scared before she came about the budgeting a period of time after she came. So at six to eight months, we can you imagine we were getting happy to go into the budgeting process. So she introduced so many models and, and normalized this as, as our target and the way to be. And this is practically the job. But something more than that, what they were doing, and I find this genius. I don't know which idea was this. Um, the negotiators were designed, so we were negotiating high level, high visibility contracts, multi-million contracts, right? Even nine-figure contracts. And the negotiators were designed based on the gender parity of the opposite negotiation team. So for example, if the negotiation team of the supplier mostly the case, or it was at least it was the case in my manufacturing and supply, the negotiation the negotiators they were coming with four, five, six males, you know, in the negotiation team at the table. And then automatically they would have designed Bristol, uh, um, a lead negotiator as a woman. And that changed the entire perspective, the entire uh, dynamic of the negotiation. And it shaped my career absolutely enormously because this is a fabulous learning. You know, you can't, the best learning is by doing and being facing from mistakes or even successes, okay, you don't really learn from successes. But um, the fact that they have been designing something like this, I, I really think it has been an idea of a woman. And it did not impact it only me, right? It impacted the entire organization, you know, and the generations coming after me and after me and after me. So I find this fantastic, you know, to uh, establish a basis where it is sustainable, you know, so you practically put something that is going to make it work for two, three generations after you of women. And I'm very grateful for this, obviously. Because the change is, is very recent. What did help me a lot is, um, of course, the woman, but as well to have uh, my manager who is extremely supportive, who says from the beginning, you know, I have your back. We're in this together. And that helped me um a lot and I want to answer as well your question where you said what are you going to do now and, and, and what is my organization um, doing now so in my organization 35% of the women are in leadership positions 
and we want to increase that uh, in the global operations uh, global operations organization to 50 percent so what we continue to do is um, um, have the hybrid environment and it's not because of COVID is over that we pulled that back so that remains and I can tell you that not only the females, but as well, the males in our organization benefit enormously from that. There's so many calls that I have with my team where I see as well the men with the children on their lap. And I think that's that's amazing. And um, as well, of course, um, I think we need to remove the bias around working moms. The, 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 the thought that... Um, yeah, that women who have children or women who are part-time, there was a bit of a surprise to me as well when I joined, that those women don't always feel supported. So I think it's important as well that we remove the bias uh, away from that and that they feel that they can grow in their career and that we listen to them to their next steps. And it's okay if you're a woman and you want to take a break, that's fine. But you should be able to re-enter the workforce um, and, and, and yeah, follow your ambition. Thank you both for, for sharing those. And I think it touches upon a, a really, I suppose, interesting and, and, and difficult topic around both what you guys are doing within your organisations, but also what organisations as a whole need to do to, to support and elevate and enable women to, to progress further. So are there any kind of wider organisational changes that, that you see happening and kind of obviously opening up to, um, to to those on the call as well to share any insights around what more can be done? I mean, look, mentoring, it has been since long, right? So this this the following words, they're not going to be um, novelty for anyone probably here. Um, the training on diversity and inclusion, the, everyone is talking about, you know, the career path, the development, um, the succession planning, uh, supporting the, um, how we call this, uh, women's network associations within the company. But this is something, at least me, I'm hearing this since 15 years, right? Things are moving, but not at the speed that probably we will pretend to have this 50%, you know, because everyone is going in this direction. And I think it should really arrive there by 2025. What I'm expecting is literally from an HR and diversity and inclusion perspective to work ruthless and to be very bold. So I mean by this, because I have been hearing more and more, a department has less females and then, yeah, the, they should prioritize the interviews with the females. And I have been hearing, well, you know, we haven't found somebody who is really qualified. We haven't found a woman, so we gave up and we just hired somebody else. Well, trained, trained the woman. There's no compromise here. You have to go bold and we have to be a little bit tough, um, not lunatic, but trying to get the best out of it, right? Um, I'm also expecting, I saw the pool now that Luke has been running. I mean, I know in the fact that there is still um, a, a gender payment difference. Right now in pharma, 100%. I, I, you know, if you are really leading teams and you have legacy teams, you just see this is happening and then you wonder why the same preparation, the same age, the same experience, you know, he is getting a little bit more than her with 18. The 20% uh, batch, I think it dropped a little bit, but we are not at 0% and we should be at 0%. Now, what I would like to see, and I think some of the companies for sure, you know, a Biogen has this and it's very nicely done, you know, by the new CEO, and other companies, I would like to see a policy, you know, from the stakeholders to the board of directors, for example, to have a certain um, must in the positions on the, you know, on the board of directors and as a CEO and even in the executive leadership teams, we don't have that much representatives. But as soon as you go N minus two, N minus three and lower levels, yeah, okay, we are fine there in represent, representants. But we need to change that, that piece up. And in order to change it, you have to have rules. You need to have a policy, which rules are made to be broken, but still at least on the paper, right? And one other element, which I think is very important for women, as representatives is once they reach a certain level, let's say director, 
they should have, there is no obligation right now to have this leadership training. It's like on, you know, wish bad basis. If you want to go for the training or for self-development, but it should really be invested. The company should be invested in having these women creating that trustworthiness um, because you can you, you can teach leadership, but we women are, are on our biological function, we are not, you know, made to take. We are giving away. So for us, you know, we have to understand that is balancing the brain and the, the, the heart. That it's okay. It has to be a balance. And I see this going, you know, since since couple of years. But I still believe there is there is opportunity there to elevate the woman to trust themselves. To be as vocal as I am right now and as passionate as I am, um, because that's the only way we change, right? And to dare, to dare. Absolutely. And what's your experience been around? Because I, I know some organizations are are fantastic, others less so, around female accelerated leadership um within their female population. So you know, uh, high performers are actually identified. And, and to your point of, well, if they can't recruit females at the top, it should be naturally coming through. They should be seeing the the skills and, and training that those up to those senior positions. Have you seen that? And do you think that that works well? In corporates, in higher, so bigger corporate, corporates, this is, um, there is a target right, of diversity, and I would say they comply to the target. So this is happening, Alicia, 100%. It's really an infusion, you know, of, of the female leadership, you know, trying to be elevated. Now, I am in Switzerland, and, you know, there is still there is still that uh, legacy on, I mean, if you compare this with the mid-sized company, I, I cannot speak about other countries, but if you have a Swiss organization, for example, this will be a little bit, I don't see enough movement there, right? Um, but in higher corporates, international, where folks have, you know, high diversity, I think it's happening, yes. I think as well, um, and I saw just a comment from someone uh, coming as well from Zoetis. So uh, at Zoetis, we had a female CEO, and she was she she was extreme about diversity and inclusion. And with extreme, I mean, she made it a target, and I think after a year, her leadership was half male, half female, half white, half other color. So, and I must say, when I in in for us I, in Europe, we thought it was sometimes a little bit extreme. But then, when I went to a European company, I realized sometimes you need to go on the extreme side to land somewhere in the middle. Because then I realized for the first time, in in, in countries like Switzerland, like Germany, that there is still way more work to be done. And I think it's not only the companies have a role to play there, but it's as well the government. It's it's not only a task of, of, of a company. If, for example, you have a daycare, a country where the daycare closes at two o'clock, okay, you can say it's either the man or the woman, but it makes life not easier. The government has a role to play as well. Yeah, I could see you very patiently, Lee. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Lee Mers, I actually work with Alicia at Proxima as a principal consultant. Um, I've been a management consultant for over 20 years in various different industries and categories. Primarily, I do sourcing in the IT and tech space. But I can tell you in my whole career, um, having that, not just women in leadership, but just men that are supportive of the women. You know, what you were saying, Roxanne, about having um, women that are capable to get to that next level. And if they can't recruit people from the outside, you have to support and motivate those within. I know that I'm called out a lot in Proxima. I'm very, um, I, I speak out a lot. Alicia can tell you, like, I participate. I put my face out there. I I'm loud. I get involved in a lot of different things, but I've always been told if I want something, I have to take it myself. And I do that. And I, I put myself out there. I make myself uncomfortable. I have a small child at home. I don't have help with childcare. But to me, what would be helpful is to have those in leadership that say that 
to actually promote me to get to that next level. So I feel I take things and I drive things and I run things, but there's always challenges and it's, it's them in leadership that have to be supportive and help me get to that next level. I mean, we don't have a significant female leadership percentage, you know, in our organization and the males will say things, but it's like, how do they actually get me to that next level if I'm deserving? So I, you know, it really hits home for me. What you were saying is that if we're not recruiting the right women, take advantage of the, you know, the breadth of women that are capable internally, but it's not just me making that choice and driving it. It's them elevating me to get there. Thanks, Lee. And I, th I think it talks to that point of, you know, elevating women. We, we you know, we can all be in rooms and, and speak great things about our female colleagues, but it's also ensuring that our male counterparts also speak great things and, and you know, see opportunities of being able to, to ultimately elevate talent and uh, elevate those regardless of, of gender, but seeing the positives and seeing the differences that come from having women in in certain positions. I think, Roxanne, you, you kind of touched upon it and, and I can see you smiling that I think women bring a completely different dimension. Um, you know, as you were saying about uh, Bristol Myers' approach to negotiations of of actually being able to, 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 to have different viewpoints. I mean, having women, you know, it's known. You have innovation. I mean, in any organization you look, right? You have a diverse perspective. In the fact, you know, I know that women are in R and D, right? If you have a PhD, you have men and women, and you work with everyone. And it's very interesting to see how a woman it's looking at at a certain experiment and is designing and interpreting this, and how men does it, right? So we absolutely need both, but they have to be balanced. That's the only thing we ask. Right. Yeah, it's the same with um, uh, to pick up on the point of uh, Roxanne, how we are different. I'm thinking about the negotiations when it negotiations um, it's with women as well. With us, it was not about to win. Uh, I remember I, we built relationships and we learn about the private life of our. I, I'm not saying men can't do that, eh, but I, I see something more specific perhaps to women. Um, you build relationship with your vendors, you speak about the private life and you get things quicker done in terms of negotiations. It, that was my opinion. And as well, when I negotiated with a woman versus a man, with a man, sometimes it's competitive and I want to win. And with a woman, it was more like, let's make a deal that works for both of us. And within five minutes, the deal was done. I think that's, that's a really interesting point. And I think something as you were talking, reflecting on negotiations that I've had and, and the number of times that there are such drastic, di drastically different approaches. And I think that point around competition is a really, really good one. So a, a question to, to both yourselves and everybody else on the panel really is we've spoken about, um, you know, kind of elevating women around us, how the, um, the, the talent throughout the pipeline is is elevated. What advice would you give, and I'll, I'll phrase it in two ways, what advice would you give to younger women starting out in their careers? And also what advice would you give to your, your younger selves around what they could, what what you would advise yourself to do differently or approaches around imposter syndrome and and that type of thing? Yeah, I would, for me, clearly, don't doubt yourself, you're capable. So if somebody comes with an offer to you, it's because they believe you're capable. Why would you doubt yourself? And then um, what I think it's important for uh, advice I would give to other women is as well, be confident to speak up and be visible. A thing that I did where I was uh, good at um, was self-promotion. And I don't think that a lot of women do that. So whenever I had a success, I shared it with my boss or with the leadership. Um, I did this negotiation. I achieved so much uh, savings for the company. And I was not afraid to do that. So I did a lot of self-promotion. So they knew what I was capable of. And I think that is something that more women need to do as well, create this, this awareness. And don't think that you're, how do you say, bragging or, um, yeah, 
I think this is part of the corporate world, a bit of uh, self-promotion. And be as well your authentic self. Don't think that in order to advance, you need to become a bitch. Hey, sorry for the word. But, you know, you, sometimes you just be your authentic self. I think that's a really good point. And I, I, I think I suppose it, it's, it's being authentic and being a woman and not trying to be a female version of a negotiator. Exactly. Don't copy male behaviours. Just be yourself. I think, you know, for, for quite a while, I still remember I had my suits, you know. I did not have a rock. I had only the pants, you know, because I had to fit in the mask, honestly. Because honestly, and I mean, from the beginning in my career, I was in the room, as I said, starting, you know, with 28 gentlemen in the team. It was not their fault, neither mine, because I was the only engineer, right? But I think it does something to the way you perceive yourself and the way you perceive life. And something I haven't done, Elke, this is the advice I would give and I give to my teenagers and to myself, my younger self. Um, go, look, read, listen to Carla Harris. If anyone is familiar with Carla Harris, um, she has been... It's a speaker for the moment. She has been writing books. She has been on the Wall Street. And practically what she's saying is in order to be successful, you need mentorship and you need sponsorship. Without the sponsorship, you will never advance in any corporate. You, you can't advance in a career. The second would be learn to communicate. Learn to communicate. Because I think we have a gap in the communication and I don't talk about, you know, human to human communication and not TikTok to Insta communication, which more and more is becoming, you know, with the generations taking over. Um, and I have a quote, which I absolutely adore from uh, Tony Robbins, which I unfortunately learned a little bit or adopted a little bit late. The quality of your communication determines the quality of your life. And this is so, so true. Obviously, the speaking up, it's a must, because if you speak up, the others will, you will inspire others, and others will inspire others. And this is how you change the world, and this is at least your world you will change, right? So never keep back, because it's not making anyone happy. And um, I would say something else. I would say become the expert in at least one field. You, if this is science, if this is business, if what, whatever it is that you have been doing in a school or you are passionate about, you should be at least in one thing expert and it should be yours. And when you have this, you know, you carry this with and you share it with the world. The, the world is definitely going to appreciate. And last but not least, and I'm very um, passionate about this as well, exactly to your point, LK, because you said that B word, but be kind. Always be yes. kind. Never compromise for anything. There is no reason to be anything else than kind. Right? I found the Sheryl Sandberg quote. I found it like two days ago. She stands there tall and she says, in the future, there will be no female leaders. They will just be leaders. And there is where we need to go. Fantastic. That was incredibly inspiring. So just for closing comments, are there um, any other insights, advice from, from those on the call? I just want to share one uh, thought as well. When I pro progressed in my career, it was because of great male leaders I had who were supportive as well. So I don't want this to become, you know, man versus woman. I have been incredibly supported by my male bosses and they made me, uh, made that I advanced in my career as well. And I guess to Elke's point, I would just like to say that as women, I think we need to remember that we are the best advocates for ourselves. You know, early in my career, I always thought all I needed to do was work really hard and I would be recognized for that work and be promoted. And to a certain point, I was, but um, I think we need to, as also, as Elke said, the self-promotion is important and we need to push for ourselves and not expect it to happen. You know, if we want to get promoted, we need to make that clear 
to everyone around us and we need to really fight for it and also fight for the salary and the title as well. It's um, we need to work extra hard for that. And unfortunately, or hopefully in the future that will go away, but no one's going to fight for us better than ourselves. Fantastic. Thank you so much. So I found one a um, longer time ago, which it, it's said by a man, right? I think it's a poet, uh, Brigham Young, maybe it's known. He said, you educate a man, you educate one man. You educate a woman, you educate a generation. And this was like, well, if this does not say it all, I don't know what to say more. Thank you so much for the opportunity um, to be authentic and, you know, just to feel home. Thank you so much. More than welcome. Thank you both for being your authentic and open self on the, the call today. That's fantastic. Thank you so much to LK, Roxana, Alicia and everyone who contributed to such a fascinating conversation. If you're interested in connecting with possible mentors or mentees, you can do so through the Pharmasource platform. Just head to pharmasource.global and once you're registered, you'll be able to search the members directory to find people who are either interested in being mentors or would like to be mentees. As was said earlier, mentorship is one sure way to improve things. So hopefully you'll find that helpful. Thank you for listening.